This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Here in the United States, nearly a quarter of hospitals are reporting critical staffing shortages as Omicron it drives an unprecedented surge in infections. This comes as public schools in Chicago are closed for a fourth day, as talks between the teachers' union and Mayor Lori Lightfoot over in-person teaching remain at an impasse. For more, we're joined by Ed Young science writer at The Atlantic. He won the Pulitzer Prize for explanatory reporting for his coverage of the pandemic. His most recent piece is, Hospitals are in serious trouble, and Omicron is our past pandemic mistakes on Fast Forward. We've been making the same errors for nearly two years now. Welcome back to Democracy Now! It's great to have you with us, Ed. Let's start with the hospitals. Explain the serious trouble our hospitals are in. Yeah, they are at breaking point. Um, it, it's it's really hard to overstate um, how badly hospitals are faring right now. Even before the Omicron wave, um, they were already in trouble because so many healthcare workers had left because of the collective traumas of the last two years of the pandemic. And now we have first, firstly, a Delta wave, and now Omicron on top of that. Um, huge volumes of patients are flooding hospitals, and. While Omicron is less severe than previous variants, it's so contagious that the sheer number of those patients is so high that there are still a lot of very sick people, and there are a lot of people full stop. So they are inundating hospitals at a time when there are fewer healthcare workers than ever before. Those healthcare workers are demoralized, they're exhausted, and a lot of them are out sick because they have breakthrough infections from Omicron. And all of this means that hospitals are I, like, I really struggle to use words like crumbling because I don't want to over, like exaggerate the risk, but that is what I'm hearing from people all around the country. People are waiting for six to 12 hours to get seen for any kind of emergency procedure. People in the ER are uh, on ventilators waiting to get into ICUs, which are full. The entire system is clogged up, and it's not just about COVID anymore. This now means that medical care for basically anything is worse than it was two years ago because the system is just so completely flooded and unable to cope with the volume of patients right now. The National Nurses uh, United said going to work should not mean putting your life and the lives of your loved ones in danger. A group of nurses' unions and the AFL-CIO have demanded the federal government enact permanent rules to ensure workplace safety, saying all frontline health workers should be guaranteed personal protective equipment, exposure notification, ventilation systems, and other life-saving measures. Can you talk about this kind of order? organizing that's going on. Yeah, I think a lot of healthcare workers are fed up. Like there's there's sort of a culture, um, a social contract in medicine that you sacrifice yourself for the sake of your patients. And while that contract means that the rest of us get decent medical care when we expect it, it also creates the conditions where healthcare workers are very easily exploited by society at large, as we're seeing now, and by their own particular institutions. So it's no surprise after two years of this, after feeling betrayed by the public, by a lot of the places they work for, that a lot of them are starting to organize, that there's more movement towards unions, that there's more um, more of a sense of, like, we just cannot take this anymore. And I commend that. I do think that, like, that's necessary for creating this more stable medical system. What I worry is that there are a lot of people who, you know, rather than deciding to fight for this, have just decided very reasonably to stop to leave their jobs or the profession. I've heard from so many healthcare workers who have already made their choice and their decisions thin the ranks of those who are left behind to take care of the rest of us and whose jobs are now that much harder. But honestly, if so much of society has pretended that the pandemic is over and has longed to get back to normal, can you really blame healthcare workers for wanting to do the same? This is the cost of two years spent prematurely pushing towards a return to normal. It's that for the healthcare system, for our ability to get medical care, there might not be a normal to return to. Last week, President Biden reiterated his support for keeping schools open during the COVID surge. This is what he said. We know that our kids can be safe when in school, by the way.
That's why I believe schools should remain open. I want to get your response to this, Ed. Um, we see the Chicago schools are closed because the Chicago Teachers Union says they're not going to expose their teachers in this way. Other schools that are remaining open around the country, like in New York, are just vectors for infection. Um, so I sympathize with everyone on this side of the debate, right? Like you, on the one hand, you have parents who are really scared about putting their children in these um, conditions where um, this extremely transmissible virus is just going everywhere. I'm, I sympathize for parents who can't handle remote schooling, who just don't have the option to do that. I sympathize with teachers who don't feel that they can put themselves at risk anymore. I, I think, though, that we're sort of... <laughs> We've been put in a position where we're having to chew, we're having to like take sides between people who are all in the right. Like this is shouldn't be a, a debate in the way it's framed. The job of the federal government should have been to control transmission of this virus and to control the pandemic to an extent where this shouldn't even have been an issue. And so many of the measures that were necessary, you know, the rollout of rapid tests, um, mass mandates, all of these things have been, um, have been, if anything, like pulled back at both the federal and the state level. There's not been enough done to control the pandemic um, for two years now. And last year really wasn't that much different. Like, if because our policymakers have made bad decisions, it puts individual schools, teachers, parents in an un impossible position and sets them against each other, when in fact, I think the main problem is that the policies that should have protected all of us have not been put in place. So let's talk about what those policies should be. I mean, you've pointed out in your writing, um, for example, that when Obviously, for politicians, they want to put this behind them. So then talking about unmasking, <clears throat> the fact that there aren't tests available now, uh, though President Biden said he's going to get half a billion out to the country, um, and the fact that Abbott, um, which makes uh, Binax one of the tests, destroyed millions of those tests. Right, because we keep on treating this like a short-term problem. Like we keep on assuming that we're going to get back to normal at, 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 at some point in the near future without actually doing the work to get to that point. Rapid tests are a clear example of this. Like, why do we not have them um, deployed on a mass scale? For um, in it, Biden talks about um, deploying that number of tests out to people. It's roughly like one and a half tests per person. And I also want to talk about um, the social measures that should have been put in place right from the start. Like, we know that um, a pandemic is a social problem. It's not just a biomedical one. Like, yes, vaccines and therapeutics and diagnostic tests are great. But we need things that actually allow people to protect their livelihoods and their lives at the same time. And paid sick leave is a great example of this. It seems like a really weird measure to be talking about in the context of a pandemic. But if you can't actually take the time off to isolate or to, um, to take care of yourself if you're exposed, if your workplace conditions don't allow you to do that, then how are you going to stop yourself from spreading this disease? Like, we know that these things actually matter and can have an immediate impact, but they don't seem to be part of the, the package of measures that we've been talking about. Um, people sort of gravitate between just going on completely as normal or going to a strict lockdown. There are so many things in the middle, like... We've talked about masking, we've talked about rapid tests, we've talked about paid sick leave. Ventilation is important. Having places where people can isolate is important. These kind of measures are going on in parts of the country, but not everywhere. And there doesn't seem to be any sort of federal push to really make them everywhere, to pressure states into actually putting them into place. And that is part of the problem. That is why we're in this state, where we're having these hor horrendous discussions about schools and where we're looking at a healthcare system that is collapsing under the sheer weight of infections. Do you think this could lead to Medicare for all? I mean, it has exposed the uh, fracture of the entire system, a system that was broken already uh, in terms of who gets health care and who doesn't in this country. Now it's who dies and who doesn't. Yeah, um, you know, uh, 
people who are um, unvaccinated are actually like uh, the uninsured are disproportionate make a disproportionate um, I'm saying this terribly. A lot of people who are unvaccinated are also uninsured, right? And that says something about the medical system in this country. Like, there's this sort of tendency to paint um, vaccinated people um, as all, like, antagonistic anti-vaxxers. And I think access is still actually a large problem that isn't really grappled with. Um, I would hope that the lessons from these two years are that inequities harm us. Um, you cannot fight a vaccine, uh, you cannot fight a pandemic properly in a grossly unequal society such as what we currently live in. But that doesn't seem to be the lesson that is being learned. Like we've had lip service paid to the need to focus on inequities, but even from like leading public health voices, it seems to be a thing that is readily forgotten. And that is you know, that is part of why we are where we are now, unless we actually make efforts to protect the most vulnerable, um, to help um, people on, lo on low incomes, people from marginalized groups, disabled communities. Unless we stop treating them like disposable commodities, we're going to end up back in this situation that we currently find ourselves in. The Supreme Court hearing oral arguments around Biden's vaccine mandates. Your thoughts? I worry that we are, instead of learning the lessons that you've just talked about, um, that would make us better prepared for the next one, that we are setting legal precedent in place that would actually make us more vulnerable next time round. And, you know, there are many different examples of this. Um, state, legislat um, state legislatures around the country have put in orders that make it more difficult for people to put in, say, mass mandates or quarantine orders. Um, that contributes to how hard it is to fight something like Omicron. It is going to make it more difficult to deal with ne the next variants. It's going to make it more difficult to deal with the next pandemics, which I guarantee you we will face. 